So, uh, unit four today, we're going to be covering the Jacksonian era and the four key sections of the Jacksonian era. First, we're going to talk about the age of the common man, then the market revolution, uh, then manifest destiny, and then the second great awakening. So we're going to cover all four sections today uh, in as quick amount of time as possible. So, uh, Jacksonian era, obviously, uh, don't worry about that. Uh, one of the questions we always have to ask ourselves is whether or not Andrew Jackson was a Democrat or a dictator. The suggestion being, does Andrew Jackson really help out the common man, or was he really just mean to the common people? And so these are just two different philosophies when you look at Andrew Jackson. And so one of the first things that we talked about was the election of 1824. And in the election of 1824, uh, you don't really have any uh, Federalists running in this election. They're all Democrats. And why are they all Democrats? What happened to the Federalist Party? Yeah, they died all at the Hartford Convention, right? They all went away at the Hartford Convention. So all you have left are these Democrats. But interestingly enough, not all of these Democrats were elected the same way. John Quincy Adams was elected through what secret process? He was nominated through what process? The caucus system. He was elected by the elite. Whereas uh, Jackson, Clay, and Crawford were all nominated through what? Yeah, those nominating conventions. So make sure you guys are aware of the difference between caucuses and conventions. Now, by the end of this election, who had won the popular vote? Andrew Jackson by far won the popular vote, but unfortunately, he did not win what? Not only did he not win the majority, he also did not win the electoral vote, right? He did not win a majority of the electoral vote. So ultimately, who had to decide who became the winner? The House of Representatives. And during the House of Representatives <coughs> decision, Henry Clay offered the power of, uh, offered his votes to John Quincy Adams in exchange for making him what? Secretary of, Secretary of State. And this whole exchange is known as the corrupt bargain. So make sure you guys are familiar with the corrupt bargain. Everyone cool with that so far? Pretty simple, right? Now, obviously, you have the changes between the two political parties. Remember, is Jackson for or against the American system? Against. He's against the American system. One of the major reasons why Jackson is against the American system is because Jackson is for states' rights. Jackson believes if a state wants to build a road, who should build the road? The state. Should I have to pay for your road? No, Jackson believes in states' rights. So this is something that's different between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Democrats are a states' rights party, whereas the national Republicans are for national power. Let the national government build roads. Let the national government focus on constructing trains. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. <coughs> In any case, John Quincy Adams becomes the sixth president of the United States. And he's not a very good president. But one of the things that he passes is the tariff of abominations. Now, as you remember, this was not even a bill that he originally passed. Who ultimately crafted this bill? Or whose uh, crazy plan was it to make this bill really, really high? It was Andrew Jackson. If you guys remember, Jackson did not want us to pass a tariff, right? So Jackson said, here's what we'll do. In order to make sure that this tariff does not pass, will make the tariff so high that no one will pass it. And then what happened? They passed the tariff. And as a result, the tariff was so high, South Carolina hated it. And specifically, who from South Carolina hated it? John C. Calhoun. And so in response to his hatred of the tariff of abominations, John C. Calhoun secretly wrote what pamphlet? South Carolina Exposition. And in the South Carolina Exposition featured here, written by Henry, uh, sorry, John C. Calhoun, it said that what should we do to this tariff of abominations? We should nullify it. We should nullify the bill. Okay? Everyone good so far there? Now, do we nullify it? 
No, it never actually happens, but he at least recommends that we nullify the bill and we move on from there. So any questions so far? You guys doing okay? All right. So the electorate is changing, and as a result, this will definitely help Andrew Jackson. The first is that there are more and more people moving out west, so that's definitely a plus, as well as, again, less property restrictions, which means who can now vote? People that what? Uh, own land and also people that don't own land. So remember, what the change here, folks, is that you no longer have property requirements. And more and more people are voting. We talked about the caucus and convention system, blah, blah, blah. But what you have is, again, universal white male suffrage because there are no longer property restrictions, right? You also have more nominating conventions that are more democratic than caucuses. Uh, you have the return of the spoil system because people are now going to be given uh, positions in office. You have the rise of third parties, which gives people more options. You have popular campaigning, which means we want to appeal to these common classes. And you have the rise of a two-party system, again, which is good for the people. And again, you have a candidate similar to the electorate, which means people are voting for someone just like them. Because of this changing electorate, Andrew Jackson has a much better chance of winning in the election. And he does. He wins actually pretty single-handedly, 178 to 83, and also winning the popular vote, making him the seventh president of the United States. Now, sadly, because his wife had just passed away, he did not really do much at his own wedding. And he blamed Henry Clay for all the negative campaigning, as you guys might remember. Um, but again, here he is being the seventh president of the United States. Pretty cool. Questions there? Okay. One of the first things that he does then is he has something called the inaugural brawl. And at the inaugural brawl, he invites all the common people to the White House. Now, at first, this seemed like a good idea because he wanted the common people to see a common man president. But what ended up happening at the White House? It became too chaotic. And this inaugural ball ends up becoming the inaugural brawl. And he earns the nickname King Mob. Very good is being a king of the mobs. So one of the other things that he does that's considered to be unconstitutional is he promotes this idea called the spoil system. Now, he did not see this necessarily being a bad thing, and he referred to it as a rotation in office. And what he said he was going to do was he was going to start appointing who to be part of the government? The common people. The commoners and he said this is a good thing we're gonna rotate people out of office and we're gonna make sure that the common people can now serve themselves but the reality is many people argue that this was not a rotation in office instead this was a spoil system where he wasn't necessarily giving jobs to people that were commoners he was giving jobs to people that what yeah, that were incompetent, people that, you know, had supported him, but were not necessarily the best people for office. So again, what you have is this change from rotation of office to spoils system. Any questions there? No? Everyone's also good? Wonderful. You also have the kitchen cabinet. You guys familiar with the kitchen cabinet? Where he uh, had his friends give him advice rather than his official cabinet. And people also said this was unconstitutional because he should have used his cabinet that was appointed by the Senate and not just some random people, thus showing that Jackson might in fact be a dictator. Then there's the Peggy Eaton affair. Does everyone remember the Peggy Eaton affair? He defended a common woman and he made sure uh, that she was defended despite the fact uh, that it might end up ruining the government. And so he defends Peggy Eaton despite them making fun of her. And again, why does he defend Peggy Eaton? It reminds of his wife, who was also downtrodden and ultimately you know, died because of all the negative uh, things happening to her. So there's also Peggy Eaton affair showing that Jackson is a Democrat or a dictator. Democrat because he's defending the common woman, but also a dictator because he's willing to destroy the government over personal reasons. So it really depends on who you talk to. 
Then there's a the nullification crisis. What's this all about? The nullification crisis occurred over what? Was it over? It's about a tariff, right? Jackson lowered the tariff of 1832 known as the Black Tariff. Whoops. But it wasn't low enough. So what did Calhoun and South Carolina do? They complained and then nullified it. Jackson said, you can't do that. South Carolina said, well, try and stop us. So Jackson said, OK, I'm going to murder all of you. And he began to send in the US military. South Carolina also began to raise its own military. And ultimately, who prevents all the bloodshed from occurring? Henry Clay. Henry Clay prevents all this bloodshed by introducing the Compromise Tariff of 1833. And by doing so, he says, don't worry, everyone will be friends. We won't reduce the tariff by a lot, but we'll do it over time. OK, well, Jackson then goes ahead and says, well, I'm going to pass the force bill, which says I can pass tariffs whenever I want and collect it with the military, and you can't do anything about it. That's the force bill, the authority to collect tariffs with the military by force. Any questions about that? This is not to be confused with the force acts that have to do with the KKK. Force bill, force acts, two different things. Everyone cool with that? Cool. There's the bank war. Does Jackson like the bank or hate the bank? Hates the bank. He wants to kill the bank. He finds it to be unconstitutional. He finds it to be uh, pretty uh, elitist, pretty undemocratic. So he wants to kill it. Henry Clay says, OK, fine, kill it. And Henry Clay says, we should recharter the bank. Jackson now has a choice. If he vetoes the bank recharter bill, he's going to alienate who? The rich. If he keeps the bank recharter bill, he's going to alienate who? The poor. Jackson is given a choice, and what does he ultimately do? He vetoes the bank. So Jackson's veto of the bank recharter, here he is destroying the bank with his bank veto. Pretty cool. And Jackson says in his famous quote, the bank is trying to kill me, but it is I who will kill it. And he says, I have the right to declare laws to be unconstitutional, which my veto, and this bank is unconstitutional. Despite the fact that a Supreme Court case already ruled this bank to be constitutional, what was that Supreme Court case? McCulloch v. Maryland already ruled the bank to be constitutional. And Jackson said, I don't care, because I believe that I am what? Yeah, I am the most powerful branch of the government. I am the president. I have the final say. I represent the people. I am the most powerful. So that happens. Election of 1832, does Jackson win? Most definitely. Cool thing about this election, it's the first time there's a third party. Uh, then here's Biddle's panic. Biddle is upset that the bank is being killed, so what does he do? He creates an economic panic by recalling all loans. The economy goes crazy. People blame Jackson. But ultimately, it was Jackson's fault because Jackson killed the bank by putting all of the money where? In pet banks. Unfortunately, these pet banks were also what? Wildcat banks. And a wildcat bank was a pet bank that what? Yeah, it overspeculated with federal money. It loaned out too much of the federal government's money expecting to make that money back. Did they make that money back? No, they did not. And whose money did they lose? Federal government's money. This is problematic, and so to stop all this overspeculation, Jackson is forced to pass a law called the Species Circular Act. And what did the Species Circular Act say? You can only buy land with hard money. By doing so, this would prevent people from being able to buy land anytime soon. As a result of this, though, this causes the Depression of 1837 because of overspeculation. And now you can't buy land to prop up the US economy. Questions there? None? You guys doing okay? All right.
Jackson Native American policy was not too good. There are two Supreme Court cases you have to know, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia and Worcester v. Georgia. In Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, John Marshall ruled that the Cherokee Nation was not what? It was not a foreign nation, and instead it was a domestic dependent nation. It belongs to the U.S. It is not independent, so that's important. However, in Worcester v. Georgia, John Marshall did rule that the Cherokee had what? Property rights, which means what can local white Georgians not do? Take away their land, sell their land, steal their land, because they are allotted property rights. Was Jackson for or against that? Did Jack Jackson was against the idea of giving them property rights? Yes. In Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, um, yes, Cherokee Nation sued directly to the Supreme Court. They said, I'm sorry, we can't even hear your case because you are not a foreign country. Had the Cherokee Nation sued from the Georgia court and then made their way up to the Supreme Court, it would have been fine. But that's not what they did. They sued directly to the Supreme Court and they said, you can't do that because you're not a foreign country. So they lost automatically. In Worcester v. Georgia, Worcester sued Georgia through the regular courts until it came up to the Supreme Court, and then they decided Cherokees had property rights. So two different processes. Everyone cool with that? Awesome. Uh, and so Jackson eventually signs the Indian Removal Act saying that the Native Americans have to leave past the Mississippi River to Oklahoma. But he says they get to keep that land forever, which is kind of cool. So they do. And eventually, by 1838, you have the Trail of Tears, and a lot of Native Americans die, and it's very sad. Not very good. In fact, about 4,000 Native Americans die on the Trail of Tears. Terrible. In opposition to Jackson, you see the rise of the Whig Party, because these guys just hate Jackson. They think, you know what? I don't see why he's still president. We should get rid of him and anyone that supports him, and they're willing to take anybody. So pro uh, anti-Jackson Democrats, they'll take evangelists, they'll take nativists, they'll take anti-Masons, they'll take southern states writers. Yes, ma'am. Kind of like the Populist Party, yeah. They'll take anybody. And again, pretty much the basic foundation of this party is we're going to form a party because we don't like Jackson. That's the whole form of this party. Jackson is a terrible man. And so in the election of 1836, Jackson uh, appoints his guy, Martin Van Buren, to run against four different dudes from the Whig party. Was that a good plan or a bad plan? Smart idea did not pan out the way they wanted. And so Martin Van Buren wins because the Whigs are kind of dumb. And they lose despite having four different candidates. And Martin Van Buren becomes the eighth president of the United States. And really, the only thing you have to know about Martin Van Buren is that he inherited the panic or depression of 1837 because of the things that Jackson did. He becomes very unpopular. But one thing he does try to do is the divorce bill or the independent treasury bill, which means what do we establish? Yeah, so pretty much we create an independent treasury, which means what are we not going to do with federal money anymore? We're not going to loan it out. We're not going to go and bank with federal money. We're going to take that money, and we're going to put it over here, and when we need it, we're going to take it. But we're not going to loan the money out in the hopes of making money off of federal money. Is that clear with everyone? We're not going to lend out federal money anymore because the risk is what might happen. Yeah, people will lose it, and that's scary. Jackson goes into retirement. His only regret is that he did not kill... Clay and Calhoun, which is again pretty awesome. So, in the election of 1840, the Whigs run again. They run against Martin Van Buren, and Van Buren is not going to win because of his unpopularity. And uh, William Henry Harrison wins with what famous campaign strategy? He's a war hero, and he campaigns on the slogan of Log, Hammond, and Hard Sided. Grab a table, and there are chairs back here. 
log cabin and hard cider. He's a log cabin and hard cider president. And he wins, and he serves, and then he dies. And you don't have to worry about any of these Supreme Court cases. So that's Jackson. Any questions about that first section there? Remember, know that log cabin and hard cider stuff. That'll be on your test. Next up, market revolution. Always fun. I always found how quickly we can go through a unit when it takes us a week. We can go over it again in 30 minutes. Think about it, folks. We spent a week doing that lecture before. Done in 30 minutes. Next. Market revolution or antebellum industrialization. When we're talking about antebellum, what are we talking about? Before which war? Uh, Civil War. All right. So when we're talking about industrialization, we got to ask ourselves what's necessary. Of course, you need a population because what does a population provide? And labor and consumers. You need people to buy your stuff. You also need natural resources, coal, iron, all that jazz. You need navigable rivers and harbors because you got to be able to trade. And you got to be able to power your steam engines. <coughs> you also need good communication and transportation routes. You need an overseas market, and you need a stable political system. So, folks, we have all of that. Now, the population first. You got a population that's growing. And primarily, who's contributing to that population? Immigrants. And primarily, which immigrants? The Irish. The Irish. From the 1840s, primarily because of the potato famine. The potato famine drives the Irish to America. Are they educated, not educated? Not really educated. They're mostly poor, and they come, do they come with families or no? Single, because they can't afford it, and mostly single women. So they show up, and are they wanted? Because what are they doing to jobs? Taking them away. What are they doing to wages? Driving them down. And so when you try to apply for a job, you'd see signs that would say what? Nina, no Irish need apply. They were scorned, told to go away. It was very sad and disheartening. But did the Irish become eventually successful? Yeah, they eventually uh, eased their way into the Boston police force, the firefighters, and eventually the Irish do well for themselves. They create several secret organizations, among them the ancient order of Hibernia, which helped the Irish find jobs, shelter, you know, make their way to society, all that stuff. Everyone cool with the Irish? Oh, also, where do they primarily live? Do they move out west? Do they move to the south? Why can't they move to the south, by the way? Well, they don't have money, but why can't they get, you know, like move to the south and get jobs? Because there's slaves there. Think about it. Are there cities in the south? No, because there's mostly plantations. So where's the only place they can live? In the northeast, along the coast, in the cities, right? So no, they lived along the eastern cities. Cool with that? Awesome. See, this is where they live. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You didn't believe me, did you? Furthermore, Germans. You got the German immigrants. German, German immigrants are more educated. They introduce kindergarten and all that jazz, and they move out to the West, but do they really learn English? Not so much because they're farmers and they never had to learn until much, much later. But the Germans also contribute to this new immigrant population. And primarily, what religion are both of these groups? Catholics. They're mostly Catholics. So a group emerges known as the nativists. And they tell these Irish and Germans, how dare you immigrate to my country? Who do you think you are taking away my jobs, Irish and Germans? This is terrible. I'm a real American. I am a Native American, hence the name nativists. They did not like these immigrants because of their Catholicism. They did not like them because of their drinking. And they did not like them primarily because they were taking their jobs. And so they form a secret political party called the Know Nothing Party, also known as the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner. 
They don't like the Irish, they don't like the Germans, and they get violent. Sound familiar? Sounds like the Irish and the Germans doing the exact same thing to the Italians, the Greeks, the Jews, the Russians in about 50 years. It's the exact same story. Let's talk about transportation improvements. You guys have to know these in order because remember the last time you got this question, you guys didn't know when and where things happened? Between the 1790s and 1830s, what's the first thing that we built? Roads. We built roads. Did George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson use roads? Really? I'm pretty sure they walked on roads. So yes, roads are the first because they're the easiest to make. One of the most famous roads was which? Lancaster Turnpike, one of the first toll roads. And then the National Road or the Cumberland Road. Another massive road that you see here that crossed multiple states. And that's great. By the way, where did the money come to build these roads? National or federal? Federal government. Sorry, federal or states is what I meant. Federal government built these roads and were some states upset about it? Because why do I have to pay for a road that only benefits you? That's not fair. Good so far. Also being built during this time period, folks, canals. Canals are also being built during this time period. The second thing. Do you think Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, them, maybe used canals during their time periods? Maybe a little, right? Maybe a little. But canals are built during this time period to transport goods. What followed canals? Steamboats. Steamboats can go up and down river. Yes, sir. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. The national government is the federal government. So the federal government, you mean the United States of government? Yes. The national government, you mean the United States government? Yes. <laughs> Here are all the canals use and steamboat uh, routes. And following steamboats was railroads. Did Thomas Jefferson or George Washington have railroads? No. And so you need to know again what came first. Railroad building was 1790s to 1830s. Yep, these connected east and west. What else connected east and west? Roads, canals. What connected north and south? Steamboats. What connected south and west? Steamboats. Anything connecting to the south, folks, is steamboats. Anything east and west? Roads, canals, railroads. Yeah, so anything north and south, that's by water, that's steamboats. East and west, that's everything else. Everyone cool with that? You don't have to worry about all the problems of railroads. That won't come up. You should be familiar with regional specialization. The basic idea is what? Yeah, each region will start producing their own thing. The Midwest will start growing what? Foods, wheat, corn. The South will grow, and the East will focus on factories, tools, machines, that kind of thing. Because they're all focusing and we have roads and canals, we also emerge an integrated national market where everyone helps everyone, right? You have a connected market, and that's pretty cool. Everyone good there? Awesome. Communication improved. Get to California in 10 days. You don't have to know that, but I always think it's cool to bring up. Morse code telegraph. Uh, you also need to know this, but it might come up on your AP test. It's not on your test. It won't be on your final, but there it is. Transatlantic cable, also not on your final, so you guys are good there. Agricultural improvements, steel plow might be on your final. So you should know the steel plow and John Deere, mechanical mower reaper, cotton gin, definitely on your final. But the other two are just helping people farm, right? That's pretty easy. This one, cotton gin, what did it do? It revived slavery. You should know about that. Manufacturing improvements. Samuel Slater is the what of the what? Know him. He's the father of the factory system. He's your man. 
Lowell Mills, definitely low Lowell Mills. It's on every AP test I looked at before. Know the Lowell Mills. Who originally worked at the Lowell Mills? New England farmers' daughters. Who replaced them? Irish immigrants, right? So just know the two phases. First, farmers' daughters. Then, Irish immigrants. You should know about Lowell's Mills. Everyone good there? Cool. Here's their magazine. Then interchangeable parts. You should know that too. Eli Whitney made the factory system possible. He ended the Civil War, correct? He caused and ended the Civil War. Thanks, Eli Whitney, for teaching an entire unit for us. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Gin, don't worry about it, but you should just know that it's important. Vulcanized rubber, also don't worry about it. Who made it? Charles Goodyear. Charles Goodyear. Sewing machine, Howe and Singer, don't worry about it. Factory conditions, always bad. Commonwealth v. Hunt declared what? Labor unions are constitutional. And you guys are good there? Yep. Questions about that? None? So really, folks, be aware of your transportation and definitely know uh, the technologies. Lowell Mills, know the factories, that kind of stuff. Questions there? We'll move this moves us to what? Manifest Destiny? All right, let's do Manifest Destiny next. This one will also go quickly because you don't have to know most of this. It's expanding. We expanded quite a bit. You should know this automatically is Manifest Destiny, right? Whenever you see this, it's automatically Manifest Destiny. There are chairs in the back. So, Manifest Destiny. Arustuk War, you don't have to worry about this for your test, but remember, this is the Lumberjack War. It established, uh, it, it ended with the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. I'm going to throw that in there right now because I always forget to put it in. <laughs> there. It'll be there forever. Then we had the uh, Texas independence. Uh, initially, Texas declares, wants to declare independence. Uh, and uh, Mexico declares independence from Spain. And then it starts offering these guys free land. You guys remember that? They allowed them to immigrate. And they gave them some rules that they weren't allowed to do. Did they follow those rules? No. So Mexico said, fine, you can't come to Texas anymore. And America's like, no, we're going to come anyway. So Americans began to illegally immigrate into Mexico. You guys remember that? That's one of my favorite lines of the entire year. Americans illegally immigrate into Mexico. It happened. So anyway, uh, this guy, General Santa Ana, says, I'm going to kill all of you because you're rebelling. They say, too bad. Yes, ma'am. Austin. Austin was the first. Sam Houston was the original governor. Cool, so General Santa Ana says, no, you can't come. I'll kill all of you for trying to rebel. So they say, okay, fine, we're going to declare independence, and Texas becomes a republic. Then you have the Battle of the Alamo, and a lot of people die on the American side. So is America angry? But do we join the war against Mexico? Why does Jackson decide not to help out Texas? What is he afraid of? War with Texas. I mean, sorry, war with Mexico, but what else is he afraid of by annexing Texas? The slavery issue. It's all about slavery. So even though Jackson says, oh, Texas will be a great addition, he can't annex it because of the fear over sectional tensions. Everyone remember that? So you guys should know the conflict over Texas is all about sectional tensions. Be familiar with that idea. No, we did not annex Texas because of sectional tensions. I think that's a nun fighting. It is, huh? 
that's pretty hardcore. Anyway, Texas successfully wins, and they become the Lone Star Republic, and they say, America, annex us. But Jackson and Van Buren say no because of sectional tensions and fear of war with Mexico. So Texas says, wait, France, England, how about you? America says, wait a minute. Don't ask other countries to annex you. Fine, we'll do it. And is uh, Mexico pretty upset about that? But are they going to do anything about it? No. John Tyler becomes president. Who cares? Then there's the Oregon issue. Who are we sharing Oregon with? British. The British. And eventually we decide we want all of it because of the uh, Oregon Trail. In, uh, we say we want all of it, and we want it at what point? 5440. 54 England says, if you have it at 5440, we'll fight you. Why don't you have it at the 49th parallel? America says, no, we want all of it. So President Polk says, I will get all of it for you, right? Polk is the president that's all about manifest destiny. You guys remember that? Polk is the president of expansion. Polk is the president of manifest destiny. Yeah, Polk is the president of expansion. Polk is the president of manifest destiny. He is the guy. The 1844 election. He wins and he says, I will get all of these things for you. But that's because does he get all of Oregon? Nope, he gets it at the 49th parallel. And he was like, yeah, I was going to get it all for you. But then what happened uh, was that I just decided not to. What doesn't he want to do? Yeah, he doesn't want to go to war with the British. That's just going to be way too costly. And we'll probably lose that. But he does want what? He wants the rest of the West. And specifically, he wants California. So he says John Slidell to Mexico, and he says, hey, Mexico, can I buy California for how much? $30 million. Mexico says, no way. You stole Texas from us. There's no way I'm going to give you California. So Polk says, is that right? Well, OK, then. So Polk comes up with a plan. He sends the military to the disputed area. Mexico fires, and Polk says, I can't believe you shot at my troops. Why would you do that on American soil? Who doesn't believe him? Uh, Abraham Lincoln's like, I don't trust you. And so he comes up with Spotty Lincoln saying, I don't trust what this man is saying. He is a liar. So that happens. And then David Wilmot also does not trust, saying, hey, Prove that you don't want to expand slavery by signing the Wilbur Proviso, which says what? Yes, it says any land won in the Mexican-American War cannot have what? Slavery. And that way you're proving to me that you're not going to be a slave. It's not a slave conspiracy. Did they sign it? No, because clearly they want to expand slavery to the territories. Uh, and the Wilma Proviso fails, but it shows that there's what in the country? Distrust of the South. These sectional tensions are still happening. So we are forced to declare war. The Mexican-American War happens. People are shot. California becomes independent. Some battles. Pretty cool. Always awesome. We take over Mexico City, the Los Niños Héroes are killed, and we sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, as you guys might recall in 1848. And in this treaty, we end the war, and Mexico is forced to give what to America? Yeah, we give the Mexican cession to America for $15 million. Now, wait a minute. How much were we offering for California? 30 million. But they're giving us California, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico for how much? $15 million for less, you say. But in exchange, we are paying for their war debts of $3 million. So while we were supposed to give them 30 originally, now we're only giving them 18 for more. So the analogy I always like to use, as you guys might recall, is that you have three cars parked outside. I steal one of them, and you watch me steal it. Are you upset about that? Most definitely. I come back the next day and say, hey, Paula, I would like to buy this next car for $30 million. You say, no way, Mr. King, you just stole my car. 
I say, oh, okay, and then I beat the crap out of you. I then steal that car, and then I take the other car, and I say, hey, sorry for beating you up. I'll buy both of these cars for $15 million. I understand I offered you more, but guess what? I'm not giving you that much. And as I pull away, I roll down my window and I say, here's some money, go clean yourself up at the hospital. That's the three million to pay off your war debts. That's America, the bully. And that's what we did. Fun times. Here's the Mexican session. Of course, we'll eventually get the gadgets and purchase later. Um, but yeah, any questions about any of this? Absolute world, awesome, awesome, awesome. So, that's expansion. This brings us lastly to what? Annabellum reforms. Again, this is much faster when all we have to do is review here final. When we're reviewing for the AP test, we have to prepare for essays as well, which is why we're going through this quickly, because it's just multiple choice. OK. Gadsden purchase, I can't recall the top of my head. Uh, I believe it was $12 million, but we go with $10 million. Yeah, $10 million. Antebellum reforms and the second great awakening. Hmm. Again, as I said before, uh, if we're reviewing for the AP test, this will take much longer because we have to make sure you understand all the nuances because you might have to write an essay. Because we're only preparing for a multiple choice, I can tell you exactly what you guys have to know, which makes this entire process much easier. Here we go. The Second Great Awakening. Obviously, again, folks, people are moving away from the church, so we want people to come back. So one of the major things that we have people come and do is rejoin the church in this Second Great Awakening, again, revival of religion. Most of this happens in the burned up district in New York. So you guys should recall, this part will be on your test, the burned up district is where many of these religions began. And why is it called the burned up district? Because they talked about hell and you'll die in fire and brimstone and this is where the beginning of religions are. Burned up district, the bud, if you will. So religions begin here in the Second Great Awakening in the burned up district of New York. Good so far? Awesome. Know this, it's on your test. Next up, Unitarians. Not so much on your test, so don't worry about them, but they believe in one God, no Trinity. Baptists and Methodists, surprisingly, not on your test this time, so don't worry about them. Uh, that's, they will be on your final, uh, not your AP test, but they're just not, a, they didn't, I didn't find a question for them to be on your final this time around. No, these are all new questions. So you'll be fine. Um, then you have, again, the Peter Cartwright and then the Charles Grandison Finney and all that stuff, but don't worry about them either. Feminization of religion. Are women playing a much larger role now? In the church. Women are gonna play a much larger role, so be familiar with the feminization of religion. Uh, please note, folks, you should always be aware of the role of women. They're always gonna ask questions about what are women doing during this time period? What are women doing during this time period? Because men, it's always obvious, but for women, we wanna know the changing role of women. Women previously were Republican motherhood. What are women doing now? Here they're getting involved in religion. Rise of African-American churches, important, but it's not gonna be on your final this time around, but do know that we are beginning, you know, religions for African-Americans. Mormons, you should know the Mormons. Obviously, the Mormons are a uh, cre religion created by Joseph Smith. Eventually, uh, they're led out to what territory? Utah in Salt Lake City by Brigham Young. Fun fact, folks. Uh, I believe it was John Tyler actually sent the military to stop them and kill them, and they fought against the U.S. military because they were polygamists. So we actually tried to kill them way back when. And then we're like, okay, fine, truce. But we did try to eliminate them for some time. Then there's the transcendentalists. You guys remember the transcendentalists? They believed that truth could be found where? Within, in nature. We just had to find it in the individuals. 
So definitely no transcendentalism, folks. This is going to be on your final. So be aware of the philosophy of transcendentalism. And in particular, be familiar whoops, with Ralph Waldo Emerson. Of the transcendentalists, know him. Ralph Waldo Emerson is the guy that believed in practicing what? No, but specifically what? Self-reliance, individualism, all that stuff. Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's a guy about individualism, living on your own, self-reliance. Be familiar with him. Transcendentalist agenda, don't worry about it. Just know, I mean, I guess you should know, but everything that transcendentalist stood for, just be aware of transcendentalism. I think you have two or three questions on it. So no transcendentalism. Don't worry about Nathaniel Hawthorne. He's not going to be on your test. Great Awakening was important. You guys know that already. And now the reforms. The reforms are fun. I like the reforms. Um, the first of the reforms are by Dorothea Dix, and she believed in what two kinds of reforms? Prison reform and mental health reform. You guys good with that? Pretty easy. Know that prisoners should be better treated, and we should focus on what instead of what? In prisons? We, with our prisoners, we should focus on doing what with them? Rehabilitating them instead of punishing them. As for mental patients, what should we not do to them? Lock them in prison and treat them like criminals because instead of treating them like criminals, we should teach the mentally disabled or the mentally ill as being patients. They're sick. We should treat them as such. So that's a change. Then we have the temperance movement. I don't really have to know it's the temperance movement, right? You guys know the temperance movement pretty well? Alcohol, Neil S. Dow, and the main law. Women's Christian temperance movement. It's women getting involved in church, trying to end alcoholism. Everyone cool with the temperance movement? You guys should know this one pretty well. Here's more temperance, temperance. Women's rights, hear the rub. There was a belief that women should only be doing what during this time period? The cult of domesticity, which means what? Right, but women should only be doing what? Taking care of kids, staying at home. And so in this time period, there's a pair, very powerful belief that women should only take care of the household. Women should only take care of children. Women are the only ones who can take care of the home and they should really not work. Also, are women equal to men? No. Ultimately, men are still in charge, but women should be in charge of the home. That is the predominant philosophy at this time. Do all women agree with that? Absolutely not. So for those women that rise up against it, they decide, no, women should have rights, women should have the right to vote. And so two women decide to create a convention. Who are those two women? Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And they hold a convention at Seneca Falls, called the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Here they demand that women should have the right to vote, that women should have rights equal to that of men. And they introduce something called the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, sometimes just known as the Declaration of Sentiments. And here they hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Everyone cool with that? Declaration of Sentiments, you guys know it, love it, absorb it, that's on your test, definitely. Blah, 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 blah. Education reform uh, by Horace Mann. Just know they introduced McGuffey readers all that stuff. I don't think he's on your test, though. I'm pretty sure he's not on your final. He was one of the questions, and I took it out after. I mean, again, folks, your first test when I first wrote it was like 250 questions. And then I started deleting. I, started, I hated it, too. I hated taking away questions. I'm like, oh, but you guys should know this one. Fine. Oh, I want you to know this. Fine. I hate it, guys. I hate writing tests for you, because I want you guys to be able to test every single thing. But I can't do that, because you would hate me. Like, your test will take seven days. <laughs> so every day you'll have a two-hour test. 
Uh, so women educators, don't worry about them either. Again, you should know Mary Lyon and Emma Willard. They won't be on this test, though. You should know the abolition movement, definitely. You should uh, know growth of slavery, blah, blah, blah. Oh, what, growth slavery? Cotton gin, so to be familiar with that. You should know the American Colonization Society. What did they intend to do? Send free slaves to Africa. It's the Back to Africa movement. So you should absolutely be familiar with the American Colonization Society. That is a must. We take free slaves, we send them back to Africa. Why did this fail? Yeah, one, is expensive to ship them. Two, slave owners didn't want to release them. And three, did the slaves want to go back to Africa? Were they from Africa anymore? No, it was like, go back where you came from. Seattle? Uh, I was born in Charleston. Now you want me to go back? I can go back to Charleston if you want, but I've never been to Africa. Then there's the American Anti-Slavery Society also known as the American Abolition Society, led by William Lloyd Garrison. This is one that you guys struggled with last time as well. So make sure you guys are familiar with this one. They believed in immediate abolition. They believed in ending slavery quickly. And they didn't believe in compensation. They didn't believe that this should be slow. They didn't believe in compromising. They said, we're going to end slavery now. Because you've had free labor for the last few years, you should be familiar with the American Anti-Slavery Society and William Lloyd Garrison. He gives the very famous quote um, that I forgot. Probably not going to be worth it anyway. Uh, don't worry about Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth today, but you will likely have to know them for your semester, spring semester final. Don't worry about Harriet Tubman, but do know that she is the savior of her people, the Moses of her people. Here she is using the Underground Railroad. Huh? Canada was still part of England. It was still part of the British Empire. It, is it autonomous now, governing itself? Yes, it's self-governing, but technically at the time, it's still part of the United Kingdom. 1900s. Sue. Utopias, I don't think there are any on your test, as far as I remember. Uh, double check your sheet there real quick, folks, that I gave you. Are there any utopias on your uh, checklist, on the study guide I gave you? I'm pretty sure there aren't. Any utopias? Can you guys double check real quick? Do you see any utopias on that list, on unit four? Yeah, I don't think there are any. I think I focused on religions, but not utopias. None? Okay, so yeah, so again, just really quick, Shakers, you guys remember, they uh, were led by Mother Anne Lee, they believe in celibacy, and they surprisingly stayed around that long, despite the fact that they were not allowed to have sex. New Harmony was a communitarian utopia, they focused on hard work and communism, also fails because people are naturally greedy. Crazy one that makes spoons and forks and knives and believed in free love and communal ownership of land and children and all that stuff, and you know, they all owned everyone's children and they believed in eugenics. Brook Farm was a transcendentalist community and that's it. And we're done for today. <laughs> so uh, again, that was a pretty quick, but are you, do you guys have any questions about any of it? It's pretty straightforward, right? I think, and here's the really awesome thing, guys. By the time we study for the AP test, you'll have heard it for a fourth time. Because we already studied this once we went we had a review already this is the third time you're hearing it and when we review for the ap test again it'll be your fourth time so i think that you guys are learning it pretty well so i think you guys will be okay our next tomorrow night from five to seven tomorrow night from five to seven five to seven yeah it'll be here again thank you guys have a good day it'll be unit five